very glad you could join us. Thank you. I'm Felicity Ezewike. Our coverage tonight begins in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Following concerns raised over the whereabouts of the country's president, the presidency has announced that President Bola Tinubu and his aides will return from Europe on Wednesday. Special Advisor on Information and Strategy to the President, Bayo Onanuga, announced this in a post on his ex handle. On April 22, Tinubu left Abuja, the country's capital, for the Netherlands on an official visit. The presidential spokesperson, Adjurin Galali, said the president was visiting the Netherlands at the invitation of Prime Minister Mark Rutte. After the engagement in the country, Tinubu traveled to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, between April 28 and 29 to attend a special World Economic Forum meeting. Another of our lead story tonight, the Senate has set up a seven-member ad hoc committee to investigate the circumstances surrounding the delay in the completion of the $18.5 billion Abuja Centenary Economic City project, 10 years after commencement. The committee was set up following a motion sponsored by Senator Ashiru Oyelola, who noted that the original estimated investment for the project in 2014, pegged at $18.5 billion dollars, was designated as a free trade zone under the regulatory oversight of the Nigerian Export Processing Zones Authority. The committee was tasked to review the original public-private partnership agreement and recommend amendments, if necessary, to facilitate smooth and expeditious completion of the project within a defined time frame. The Central Bank of Nigeria has instructed banks in the country to implement a cybersecurity levy on transactions According to a circular issued by the central bank, the levy will be implemented starting two weeks from now. The directive applies to commercial, merchant, non-interest and payment service banks, as well as other financial institutions, mobile money operators, and payment services providers. Exempted from the levy include loan disbursements and repayments, salary payments, intra-account transfers within the same bank or between different banks for the same customer, intra-bank transfers between customers of the same bank. Also exempted from the levy were inter-branch transfers within a bank check, clearing and settlements, latest of credit, banks recapitalization related funding, only bulk fund movement from collective accounts, savings and deposits, including transactions involving long-term investment among others. Let's tell you that the Nigerian Labour Congress has rejected the newly introduced cybersecurity level levy by the Central Bank of Nigeria, demanding its immediate withdrawal. In a statement by its president, Joe Ajero, the NLC lamented that the levy is another anti-people policy of the government amid economic hardship. According to the statement, the Nigerian Labour Congress vehemently condemns the recent directive by the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, to levy a 0.5% cybersecurity levy on electronic transfers. The union adds that the levy to be implemented by deductions at the transaction orig origination is yet another burden on the shoulders of hardworking Nigerians. Same with the Central Bank. The bank has directed banks to stop charges on cash deposits until September 30, 2024. The Apex Bank disclosed this in a circular dated May 6, 2024, signed by its Director of Banking Supervision, Adetona Adedeji. Customers of some of the deposit money banks raised concerns that the banks have begun collection of processing fees for cash deposits as of May 1. Based on the bank's move, 2% was to be charged on deposits above 500,000 for individuals, while corporate account holders were to be charged 2% of deposits above 3 million naira. The Apex Bank directed financial institutions to continue to accept all cash deposits from the public without any charges till the end of the third quarter. Let's bring you the latest from Rivas. That southern state in Nigeria, we understand that the leadership of the All Progressive Congress in that state has urged the 27 members of the State House of Assembly loyal to the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Yesom Wike, to commence an impeachment process against Governor Siminalaye Fubara. The state APC caretaker committee chairman, Tony Okocha, 
made the call on Tuesday at a news briefing in Port Harcourt. He said the governor has continued to disrespect President Bola Tinubu by refusing to implement all the eight-point peace agreement reached in Abuja on the political crisis in the state, to which he appended his signature. He added that the APC's charge to the Assembly is to immediately commence an impeachment process against the governor. Staying in River State, the governor, Siminalai Fubara, has declared the Martin Amawule led House of Assembly as floating and non existent, and as such, has no valid potency to take binding legislative decisions on the state following their defection. The governor disclosed this while addressing a delegation of traditional rulers and opinion leaders from Bialsa State, led by Senator Sibiaka Dixon, former governor of the state, who paid him a courtesy visit at the government house in Port Harcourt. The governor maintained that he had acted like the big brother in the crisis, not interested in destroying the house so that meaningful development can continue to be engendered in the state while securing tenable political relationships. Subjected myself to every meeting of reconciliation for peace. And what happens? It is each time we come out from one meeting, we are faced with one thunder or lightning. Let me say it here. The young people, those group of men who claim that are assembly members are not assembly members. They are not existing. I want it to be on record. I accepted that peace accord for, to give them a floating. That's the truth. There was nothing in that peace accord that is a constitutional issue. It's a political solution to a problem. But I think it's according to a time when I need to make a statement on this thing so that they understand that they're not existing. The existence is me allowing them to exist. If I did recognize them, they are nowhere. You don't know what I'm going through. I'm working with my own enemies. Imagine where your commissioner, your attorney general will go to sabotage you. It's as bad as that. But they will get, they, they will get their reward. Not in this world, though. in this world. What brought us to this level is we don't have leaders in River State. Let's not pretend. What is happening in River State even happened in Bayaza. But people could call and say, don't do this, don't do this, and he said, let's let it go. It was done here. But nobody listened, because the leaders have sold their conscience. There is no complete river state without Bayasa. We must work together to develop our states. For more on this, we are joined by a lawyer and political commentator, Gongote Obedia. He joins us from Port Harcourt. Thank you very much for joining us. You, you just saw uh, the governor talking tough there on the one hand. And then we had the story earlier of the APC caretaker chairman instructing the uh, members to start an impeachment uh, process against the governor. What is your thinking uh, here? Can you hear me? Right. Good evening. Um, thank you for having me. Um, looking at the issues, um, oh, what the f yeah, I can hear you clearly. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Go All ahead. All right, looking at, the, looking at the issues, I want to state clearly that um, well, what is happening in the United States is um, it's, uh, multifaceted in the sense that there are both political issues and legal issues. The legal issues are, are the fact that um, the assemblies, the assemblies of rivers, the rivers that are assemblies are a creation of the law, a creation of the constitution. They, they do not exist as a matter of choice. They exist as a matter of legal and constitutional necessity. And hey, I think we're having some connectivity challenge uh, with um, our guest, Gogote. Uh, we might need to uh, pause.
pause that interview and maybe come back in the course of the bulletin. But for now, let's move on to other stories. The Nigerian Army officers of the Short Service Commission and the Direct Service Commission from across the country have converged on just the Plata State Capital for a conversion examination that will better position them in the service. When concluded, this will be one of the major ways of increasing the number of combatant officers of the Army in fighting insurgency, as well as standing a chance for a longer service here in the military. New Central's Chizoba Anyowi was at the opening ceremony of the conversion examination and now reports. The Nigerian Army is working assiduously to stem insurgency in the country as well as ensuring adequate security of lives and property. One of such measures is to increase the number of combatant personnel of the Nigerian Army in the fight against insurgency and other forms of criminality in the country. President of the Conversion Board, who also doubles as the General Officer Commanding 3 Division, said the significance of the exercise cannot be overemphasized. The conversion is very significant in the career progression of Nigerian Army officers of the Short Service Commission and Direct Short Service Commission, especially those who want to continue in the service of the country after a particular service year, as provided for in the harmonized terms and conditions of service. A total of 528 of these personnel won't just be examined on their physical efficiency, but also on other aspects as deemed fit by the Nigerian Army Medical Standards. And during the assessment, you will undergo various physical, laboratory, and radiological examinations to determine your fitness based on the Nigerian Army Medical Standards. These tests will include evaluation for physical infirmities, eye tests, blood infection, drug abuse, as well as organ function. While urging them to put up every required armor, ranging from training, experience, among others, Major General Abubakar assured the board will uphold fairness in the discharge of this onerous task. The conversion exercise, which ends in two weeks, is for officers for the rank of lieutenants. In Jaws for New Central, Chizoba Anyui. Thank you, Chizoba. Let's go to security matters now. A report published by SBM Intelligence says insurgent activity appears to be gradually intensifying even as the Nigerian military continue to strive to tackle insecurity across the country. The report indicates that gang violence continues to endanger commercial enterprises. Also, the issue of overlapping responsibilities undermines coordination between security agencies. New Central's Ni Omoni has more. The kidnap crisis in Nigeria's North Central, the mountain death of servicemen in ambushes in the Northeast, and killing of 85 civilians in a drone strike, which overshadowed the success of the military in the fight against bandits in the Northwest, are a few of the many security challenges Nigeria still grapples with. According to an intelligence report compiled by SBM Intelligence, security forces across Nigeria have been battling a spate of violent incidents over the past week. From gang clashes in Edo State to banditry, kidnapping, increased e-swap activities, gun violence and forced brutality. Insurgents seem to be slowly regaining momentum. Last year made it 10 years since the military was deployed to fight Boko Haram in the Northeast. They've never left. They're still there even though there are plans to rewind down the participation. But we find that, instead of returning to the barracks, the, the multiplicity of the challenges the Nigerian state face, our faces have now, um, have now made their task even more difficult. The proliferation of local arms manufacturing further compounds the already intricate security environment. 
the past one year or two, we are now seeing things like general purpose machine guns that was used to take down uh, an aircraft in, in Zamfara State in 2021. And we are now hearing things like mortars, we're now hearing things like uh, like IEDs, which was previously unheard of. So what it tells you is that the skill is enough to go around. Uh, the Nigerian military has not been successful enough in picking up the people who have this knowledge, this knowledge base. Um, I can't also rule out the possibility that these weapons, uh, that's the imported weapons are coming in from the porous borders. So it will be extremely difficult to convince um, families of the victims, to convince Nigerians um, that pay attention to these details um, that uh, we are doing very well in the area of security. The rise in insecurity across Nigeria's north and middle belt has increased pressure on the government of President Bola Tinumbu, who promised to curb violence when he took office in 2023. The security problem is a global problem. It's not localized only to Nigeria. There is need for us to share information. With developing issues including the growing use of vigilante groups fueling retaliation violence, increased airstrikes damaging the environment, Alongside food security threats as inflation rises, experts stress the importance of strengthening Nigeria's security architecture to reduce and confront the foothold of criminal activities within the country. Do I have that commitment from you? In Lagos for New Central, Ni Omani. Following the recent protest against the new ticketing payment policy of the Abia State government by Kekel Pritters, the authorities say enough tax grace was given to the commercial motorcyclists. The State Commissioner for Information and Culture, O.K. Kanu, made this known while fielding questions from journalists during the weekly ESCO briefing. New Central's Chinwe Ugele reports. The briefing, the Commissioner for Information, Prince O.K. Kanu, stated some decisions taken by the Executive Council. That policy mandates uh, all internet uh, service providers and um, mobile uh, network operators to immediately seize all excavations on our roads and um, to deploy uh, fiber optics until an SBV is selected to harmonize the process. However, after the briefing, Journalists confronted him with questions solely on the protest of KK operators in Omaha. His response and those of his colleagues are such that suggests that it is the government's decision to get the KK operators pay weekly levies. Um, that's not the way to complement a government that shows some level of compassion uh, with KK riders. Recall what the government said that you. We all are aware of it that uh, for about six months of this administration, nobody got that. Then. That was a way to help them. It's not just enough to complain that everything, no matter how sound or good the policy is, as long as it, it doesn't have to do with don't pay money. Uh -huh. That's the only one you want to hear, don't pay money. But anything that has to do with sanity, you do not want to hear it. So, but like here, you are the the, the Gala DG has said, everything will be reviewed. We will continue to interact with them. We will find a common ground that will be good for everyone. KK operators on Monday during their protest questioned the rationale behind the policy to make weekly remittances to the state coffers. We are buying a ticket from 200 naira to 250, from 250 to 300 to 350. Automatically change that is every week, which is the status is 2000 naira. But bear it in mind, it's not that everybody is working daily. Although the government says it has shown enough mercy for the KK right in the past, there is still need for it to look into the demands of the operators who constitute 90% of intra-city transportation in Omaha. In Omaha, Fonius Central, Chinwe Ugele. Over 300 landlords, including their tenants in communities in Asaba, the Delta State capital, Nigeria's south-south region, risk being homeless following the state government's resolve to recover all government-owned land. New Central's correspondent, Austin Azu, who visited the communities, brings us details. Umunicher, 
and Iyase communities, sitting on a very large expanse of land directly opposite the Osadebe University Asaba. Delta State Capital, with a stretch to the River Niger Bank, is among other places mapped out for demolition by the state government for alleged erection of buildings on government owned land. That tax force has been empowered to go and recover every government land across the state, anywhere in the state. If they find the land, still there's somebody trespassing, just land. It will be recovered. If they find any structure on it, that structure will be pulled down. Worried by this development, residents of the communities are on the major roads and streets of Asaba, carrying placards with various inscriptions to protest the government's policies. <laughs> the exercise temporarily put on hold to some economic activities before arriving at the government's house gates to register their grievances. We no longer have where to stay. We have become fugitives in our motherland. What type of oppression is that? We know that government, they have power over land, but you don't acquire land to sell land or lease land. And that particular land is genuine to us, and we need it. Chief of Staff, Government House Asaba, who received the protesters, assured them that their request would be transmitted to the governor for prompt action. So all that you have said now, I'm going to go through your letter, and I'm going to present it to the governor and we are going to set up a formal committee to liaise with you, to liaise to hear from Franco Maria's committee whether all you have alleged is correct. So you people will be invited by a formal committee, and they will listen to you, and we will see all of us will agree on a way forward. The protesters were also at the State House of Assembly to express their grievances. And the most annoying thing is that we have been served a notice that our houses, our father's houses, will be demolished in seven days if we don't evacuate our fatherland. So we are appealing to Mr. Speaker to help us present this issue to the state governor that the people no longer have where to live. In an exclusive interview, News Central visited an autogenaria, the eldest in the communities, who said the land was leased to a missionary in 1954 for skills development center purposes. He explained that the missionary who left Nigeria without consent perceived to have ceded the project to the defunct Benden government. He insisted that the lease has long expired in the year 2004 and the government of Delta State did not meet them for any discussion. But the original man who came to acquire that area was a Canadian, Kenneth Pryor, for a private farm settlement, which he established while going the Handle River to the missionaries, who later appointed certain people now who now misused it. It was a cry of the workers that the government. One thing common here is for both the government and the community leaders to come to negotiation table to advert losing billion of naira to demolition of these buildings and rendering these people living here homeless. In Asaba, for News Central, Austin Azu. Thank you for staying with us. Earlier on in the news, we brought you the story about the CBN's decision to impose cybersecurity levy on all transactions um, somewhere exempted, I beg your pardon. I'm now joined to discuss this and get a little more perspective by Ganiyu Aziz. He's a cybersecurity expert. Thank you very much, Ganiyu, for speaking with us. Yes, my pleasure. How will the implementation of these uh, levy impact the operational costs and profitability of banks and financial institutions? Uh, definitely, the, the, the fee, it simply means that uh, they are going to make more money. But if you want to go by what the act says, it means that the fees are not actually going to the financial institutions. They are to collect it on behalf of the federal government the fee is actually meant to go to Office of the National Security Advisor. So as far as the fees are concerned, it's not something that is going directly to the financial institutions. So the only way it can have probably impact 
on their profitability is that the people that ordinarily wouldn't have bothered as regards what as regards uh, transactions transferring from one bank to the other, they may have to take a second look at it. That if I should do this transfer, there is a cyber security levy that will be charged on this transaction. It may slow down the kind of transaction they will be doing a bit, but that fee, the cyber security levy, <clears throat> is not going directly to the financial institutions. So it may reduce the number of transactions that may be consummated on their platform for people that feel that uh, this is not uh, good for us. Okay, what measures are banks expected to undertake to ensure compliance with this levy directive while minimizing disruption to uh, customer transactions and services? As far as, uh, you know, when you say compliance, the compliance is in most especially from CBN to financial institutions. As far as compliance is concerned, it's just a matter of the financial institution to activate what will be doing the automatic deduction from customers' accounts. That wouldn't take them anything to do. So it's like, uh, in terms of compliance, it's almost immediate, it's almost automatic. And as far as they are concerned, consumers, customers, do not really have much to say because the deduction will be automatic. The moment you consume that transaction, the 0.5% deduction will be applied almost immediately. So compliance is something that you have not seen. It's not something you have uh, power over. It's almost immediate. You don't have control over it. Uh, I wanted to ask how this will impact this cashless uh, policy initiative uh, when people are concerned about the deductions that will take place. That is on one side. And then on the other part, I'm merging the two questions together. Considering the increasing prevalence of cyber threats targeting financial institutions, how will the revenue generated from the cybersecurity levy be allocated towards enhancing uh, cybersecurity infrastructure and capabilities within the banking sector? Honestly, I really do not understand how they intend to do this implementation. Because if we are saying that uh, you want better protection for all the transactions that are consummated on these platforms, why Office of the National Security Advisor? I want to believe that it will have been something like uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria coming up with a modality, a template, a standard of what they expect the financial institutions to have in place. That, that's okay. Considering the fact that uh, you are handling this volume of transactions, these are the kind of infrastructure that are expected to put in place. These are the kind of, uh, in terms of uh, test, penetration testing that you need to do in order to know the security posture of your infrastructure and technological services. So, but now saying Office of the Natural Security Advisor, I wouldn't know how they intend to do such an implementation. Why from Office of Natural Security Advisor why not directly the financial institutions themselves and ensure that the regulatory bodies, the NDIC, the Central Bank of Nigeria, in fact, if possible, get some cybersecurity professionals to ensure that uh, in terms of uh, maybe quarterly or annual penetration testing of infrastructure and technological devices to ensure compliance in kind of what they have in place so that customers' uh, assets, customers' data, customers' transactions can be adequately protected. That was what I All expected. Right. But saying that uh, <clears throat> if we go to Office of the National Security Advisor, I wouldn't know how they intend to do such an implementation. It's a bit uh, not clear. It's unclear. Really. I, I, I mean, there'll be a lot of questions in the coming days. And maybe we'll get some uh, clarification from the CBN as the days go by. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Gani, for speaking with us. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Tonight continues in West Africa, where Senegal's new president, Basiru Diomaye Faye, has called for reforms and efforts to dispel the misunderstandings within ECOWAS during a visit to Abidjan, where he held talks with his Côte d'Ivoire counterpart, Alassane Ouattara. In January, Burkina Faso, Niger and Mali announced their withdrawal from ECOWAS, which they accused of being subservient to France and not giving them enough support in the fight against jihadism. Je suis persuadé que nous devons continuer 
d'agir dans la solidarité au sein de l'espace CDAO, de faire les réformes nécessaires et d'œuvrer à dissiper les incompréhensions qui ne peuvent manquer de survenir. Mais je pense que les ressources sont là, la volonté politique est là, vous l'avez exprimé, et c'est cela qui contribuera au renforcement de l'unité, de la cohésion et de la souveraineté de la CDAO, qui est un outil formidable d'intégration, qui a tout le temps été cité en exemple, et que nous gagnerons à préserver. Et je sais votre engagement à aller dans ce sens-là. Alors, évidemment, au cours de nos entretiens, nous avons passé en revue la situation dans chacun de nos pays, les efforts que nous faisons. Nous sommes félicités du dynamisme de la coopération et, et surtout euh, le renforcement des relations euh, qui ont toujours marqué euh, l'évolution dans nos deux pays. Avec les découvertes qui viennent d'être faites euh, au Sénégal dans le domaine du gaz, et en Côte d'Ivoire dans le domaine du gaz, du pétrole et de l'or. Ce sont des économies qui, dans deux ou trois ans, auront des taux de croissance à deux chiffres. Et cela nous permettra donc euh, d'améliorer le quotidien de nos concitoyens dans les deux pays. Et nous avons considéré qu'en matière économique, c'était important de mettre l'accent sur, euh, euh, bien sûr, le social. Let's join our business desk for today's business news. Business news in association with Money Master PSB, the easy way to master your money. Welcome to Business News. We begin in Nigeria, where Richard Tang, the CEO of Biden, has publicly demanded the release of Tigran Gambrayan, who was detained in Nigeria. Tang stated that Gambrayan is innocent and should be released immediately. Kambarayan, along with Nadim and Jawala, Binance's regional manager for Africa, were detained on February 26 in Abuja, Nigeria. And Jawala managed to escape custody on March 22nd. Tang expressed concern over the dangerous precedent set by detaining mid-level employees after inviting them for collaborative policy meetings at the X platform. Tang also mentioned a statement made by a prosecutor during Kambarayan's bill hearing, implying that the Nigerian government was using his detention as leverage against Binance. Tang pledged to work with regulators and enforcement agencies, restructuring the organization and bringing in new leadership with compliance experience. The derivatives market in South Africa is set to adopt the central bank's new round money market benchmark for pricing short-term loans. The South African round of annuity index average, known as Zeronia, will replace the Johannesburg interbank average rate a new contract starting in the second half of this year, according to the central bank. The decision to focus on the derivatives market is based on recommendations by the Financial Stability Board, which suggests that reference rates for securities should be credit risk-free or nearly risk-free. The central bank sees the derivatives market as a good starting point for transition with the potential to assist in transitioning other markets. Zerona will be implemented in cash markets next year, and the Johannesburg Interbank Average Rate, JIBA, will cease to exist in 2026. And now Zimbabwe gets new currency makeover. In Zimbabwe, the Finance Minister, Mthulin Kube, has announced that the country will convert its annual budget, which recently introduced gold backed currency, the ZIG. Mkube stated that the ZIG equivalent of the budget will be ready to be presented by the end of the month or the beginning of next month. Zimbabwe has been transitioning to the ZIG currency since its launch on April 5th, aiming to establish a stable domestic currency. The ZIG replaces the Zimbabwean dollar. And Kube emphasized that the conversion is essentially an exchange rate translation, ensuring alignment of revenue and expenditures using a market based exchange rate. The December budget projected expenditure at 58.2 trillion Zimbabwean dollars and tax revenue at 51.2 trillion Zimbabwean dollars. And that's the offering of business news at this time. Thank you for watching. I am Perpetua Fatum Kita. The news continues shortly. Up next is sports.
Nigeria's reigning African and Commonwealth Games champion, Mercy Genesis, has departed Nigeria for Istanbul, Turkey, ahead of the Olympic qualifiers in a last-ditch effort to earn a spot for the Paris Olympic Games. The multiple African champion was accompanied by coach Aku Purity, who will take to the mat on Friday in her first match. The qualifier in Istanbul will offer 54 Olympic quotas in all the six weight classes of the three styles. Genesis, who narrowly missed out on qualification at the last African Oceania Olympic wrestling qualifiers in, in Alexandria, Egypt, is hoping to become the seventh Nigerian wrestler to secure Olympic qualification. Ashton Mutuba, Christiana Ogunsoya, Oduanyo Adekuroye, Esther Kolawole, Blessing Oborodudu, and Hannah Ruben have all secured their places. In basketball, Nigeria's Rivers Hoopers Basketball Club remained the only undefeated team in the Sahara Conference of the Basketball Africa League after routing 2022 BAO champions U.S. Monastery of Tunisia 84 to 63 points earlier today. The huge win for the Port Harcourt based team is their third straight win and puts them in a strong position to secure a spot in the playoffs scheduled to take place later this month in Kigali. Kelvin Amayo led the scoring with 30 points and 9 assists, while Ro Perry added 19 points and 9 assists. Really happy, man. Not satisfied because, you know, we need to win some more. Uh, but we're close to our goal and, you know, make it to Kigali. And uh, what can I say? I'm super happy. Nottingham Forest have failed with an appeal against their four-point punishment for breaching Premier League profit and sustainability rules. The club's case was heard on the 24th of April and an appeal board has upheld the original decision of an independent commission to impose a sanction. The commission found Forest's losses to 2022-2023 breached the threshold of £61 million by £34.5 million. It means Forest remained 17th and three points clear of the relegation zone with two games left to play. The three-person appeal board arrived at a unanimous decision to uphold the original ruling by the Commission, describing it as commendably clear and comprehensive. Brazilian defender Thiago Silva announced on Tuesday that he will rejoin hometown club Fluminense when his Chelsea contract expires at the end of the season. Silva will join the Copa Libertadores champions on a two-year deal, with Chelsea allowing the centre-back to begin training with the Brazilian club prior to his registration, transferring on the 1st of July. Silva first joined Fluminense's academy as a youth player but was forced to move away in order to find first-team football. He returned to the club in 2006 and won the Copa de Brazil before joining Italian Serie A Giants AC Milan in 2009. During his career in Europe, Silva won league titles with Milan and Paris Saint-Germain as well as the Champions League with Chelsea in the year 2021. And that's a wrap on Spot Update. I am Udoka Njoko. In entertainment, Nollywood rising talent Chimeze Imo debut as a producer with his film Strawberry Chini, set to premiere at the Essence Film Festival in New Orleans this July. Starring Genoveva Ume and Chimeze Imo himself, the rom-com portrays a Nigerian makeup artist navigating post-breakup life with her childhood friend. Directed by Cheta Chuku and produced by Chimeze Imo alongside Kele and Ngozi Okafor, the film joins the Cultural Connections lineup celebrating black stories globally. Let us now take a look at that trailer. You need to get over this guy and get yourself together. You can stay as long as you want. As long as I want. Who did back there? I am expecting a guest over later this evening. I was hoping. Now, away from the continent, 
Earlier today, a disturbing incident unfolded outside the home of Canadian rapper Drake, following the release of Kendrick Lamar's Not Like Us as a reply to Drake Family Matters. Police reported a shooting at the premises, leaving one person injured. The news shared on X ignited a flurry of, of speculations online, with many pointing fingers at Kendrick Lamar as a potential suspect. Could it be that what began as a rap beef is starting to turn into a real fight? I guess we'll find out as the story unfolds. And that's where we call it a wrap tonight on Entertainment News. We'll go on a short break and return with the latest on what's trending tonight. Moving away from entertainment news, Binance is back in the news as a highlight of our trending stories. This time, Binance is reportedly making bold claims. The cryptocurrency exchange seeking the release the cryptocurrency exchange CEO seeking the release of its detained employee recounts attempts to engage authorities, including a meeting in Abuja where criminal allegations surfaced. CEO Richard Cheng disclosed that after the meeting, individuals suggested a payment for settlement. While later, lawyers were presented with a demand for a significant cryptocurrency payment within 48 hours. Reports indicate the bribe could be around $150 million. Now, before we wrap up the story, I would like for us to see some of those reactions to this story on X. Major General Bazo is saying this man should be arrested and prove what he has said, EFCC or our court to do the needful if confirmed or otherwise. And then we have another tweet from Sin saying, can you imagine how they have taken corruption abroad? What do you expect them to think of Nigeria? Those in power requesting for payment secretly and those, request, those in power are requesting for payment secretly and they're claiming to fight corruption. Binance should close down all operations and go away with Nigerian funds. Clearly, we have um, differing opinions. Okay, we have another tweet from Michael saying, it is just like Lawrence Anini telling you that the government demanded a bribe of $150 million so as to set him free from the, from the death sentence and you believe him. Believe Binance at your own peril. They should name the person in Tinibu's government that made the alleged request. And that's where we call it a wrap tonight on what's Trending. But you can share your thoughts as well. Let us know if you agree, you know, with the sentiments of, our, of the tweets that we have just read. Share your thoughts across our social media platforms at New Central TV and Adele Simon. And that's all tonight. But before we go, let's make a quick recap of our major stories. Presidency confirms Nigerian leader Bola Tinubu to return Wednesday. Nigerian Senate sets up committee to investigate delayed completion of a Buddha itinerary economic city project. APC woos 27 pro UK lawmakers to impeach River State Governor Fubara. We also brought to news that Senegal, Côte d'Ivoire leaders have met and have discussed ECOWAS reforms. Would like to hear from you. Please send your eyewitness report to the number showing now on the screen. You can follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch live on DSTV channel 422, Star Times channel 274, Avo TV and on YouTube. Many thanks for your time. Have a good night.